We certainly hope that provinces would uh, realize their responsibility in the path of reconciliation. Tonight, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau makes a stop in Winnipeg. There's just so much out there that is either deeply stigmatized about sex workers or that sex workers themselves rarely get to speak to. Plus, For Us, By Us, a new survey by Vancouver sex workers is out now. Unfortunately, the government has not uh, you know, really and sufficiently considered their rights before uh, making the decision to, to evict them at that time. And a brief reprieve for those camping out under a Montreal bridge. Good evening, Tansay Anin. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made a stop at the University of Manitoba today, pushing his government's new budget. He also addressed the recent firestorm over the Natural Resources Transfer Act. APTN's Leanne Sanders reports. Trudeau found a welcoming crowd amongst engineering students who showed their work to the Prime Minister. Reporters then pressed Trudeau about Justice Minister David Lametti's comments at last week's Assembly of First Nations Special Chiefs Assembly in Ottawa. Lametti was asked to rescind the Natural Resources Transfer Act, but he would commit only to looking at the agreements, something the premiers of Saskatchewan and Alberta were not happy about. Both have enacted legislation asserting their control over provincial resources. Trudeau says he wants to work with the premiers and Indigenous leaders on issues of reconciliation. It is very clear that we're talking about the importance of the federal government living up to our responsibilities under UNDRIP, something that unfortunately the Prairie premiers have not taken seriously and they are instead trying to um, elevate fears that have absolutely no grounding in truth. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, the Southern Chiefs Organization, and the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations in Saskatchewan all say that their member First Nations never abandon their rights to resources when negotiating the treaties. Trudeau also responded to the news that Manitoba will not recognize Orange Shirt Day on September 30th, saying only that he'd like the provinces to move forward more seriously on reconciliation. We certainly hope that provinces would uh, realize their responsibility in the path of reconciliation and take on uh, the actions laid out in the calls to action, uh, but those obviously are decisions for the provinces to make. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The Casca Nation is taking the Yukon Territorial and Federal Governments to court over a proposed multi-million dollar mine. As Sarah Connors tells us, they claim the gov governments acted in bad faith by advancing the mine to the next stage. Here's Sarah Connors with those details. On Tuesday, the Yukon Supreme Court heard the first day of legal arguments for a judicial review launched by the Casca Nation against the territorial and federal governments. That review is focused on BMC Minerals' Kutsukaya project, a proposed open pit mine located 115 kilometers south of the community of Ross River. Casca First Nations in the Yukon have raised serious environmental concerns about the project, especially its impact on the Fennelson caribou herd. In 2022, territorial and federal decision bodies advanced the project to the next stage of the regulatory process. But the Ross River Dinna Council argued they weren't properly consulted about that decision. They claim despite sending a 48-page document detailing their concerns and assurances their views would be considered, a decision to greenlight the project was passed less than 24 hours later. Yukon government disputes those accusations. A legal response from December states the document from the CASCO was a reiteration of known concerns and the governments gave ample notice before issuing a decision. Arguments will be made on behalf of the Casca Nation, the territorial and federal governments, and BMC Minerals. The hearing is expected to wrap up next week. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. All right, thanks, Sarah. It's a small victory for those camped under the Ville Marie Expressway in Montreal. Quebec Superior Court Judge Chantel Moss issued an interim injunction of 10 days, the maximum amount of time for such an injunction, to prevent their eviction. 
Now, in that time frame, Quebec's a transport ministry and the camp's representatives are supposed to come to an agreement to find a long-term solution for the people living under the bridge and come up with a date that the transport ministry can continue construction on the bridge. If they don't, they'll return to court. Resilience Montreal, an indigenous support organization for unhoused people and lawyers from the Mobile Legal Clinic, have been fighting to prevent the transport ministry from evicting the campers for months. Eric Prefontaine, one of the lawyers representing the campers, says his team was very happy with the judge's decision. The entire judgment is uh, is in our favor and acknowledges that uh, you know the um, the people, the members of the community underneath the uh, the uh, Ville Marie Expressway have rights, and uh, that unfortunately the government has not. Uh, you know, really and sufficiently considered their rights before uh, making the decision to, to evict them at that time. We would love to hear what you think about some of the stories you've seen to start our show tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or you can leave us a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. We are taking you tonight inside one of Canada's oldest prisons to introduce you to an inmate many believe is a symptom of a system stacked against the marginalized. Ethan Wildcat was on what appeared to be a promising road to rehabilitation until he says a legal decision robbed him of a future. CTV's Manitoba Bureau Chief Jill McEshawn has his story. Behind the stone and barbed wire in this federal penitentiary, this 22-year-old is finding his way. Before I was arrested, yeah. that's, that's all it was. I was just crying. That's all I, all I knew. Ethan Wildcat comes from an Alberta First Nation, forced out because of gang violence on his own since he was 16. By 19, he was in Winnipeg and arrested. He accidentally fired a shotgun in a house full of people. No one was injured, but police found more weapons, ammunition, and drugs. At the time, Ethan, were you addicted to drugs? Yeah, it was cocaine and uh, opioids. He pleaded guilty to all charges and was put into a recovery program at Winnipeg's Moorburg House. I really liked it there. Uh, felt safe. Felt like I was living on another side, you know what I mean? Like, not in the problem. Got a break from all the negativity, I would say. There's Ethan Wildcats appearing before our provincial courts every single day. Marion Willis took Wildcat in, the youngest person to ever enter the rehabilitation program. She was unsure he would succeed. He thrived, beating his addictions, learning his culture. He went back to school, started working in an outreach program, and paid child support for his son. We bring him from the hood, you know, into Moorbrook House. He spends two years with us, excels beyond ex everybody's expectations, wants to stay, wants to continue on. And then we go to court and the judge took it all away from him. In November, Wildcat was sentenced to three years. Just weeks before, the same judge had sentenced another man from a white middle-class family who was also facing serious weapons charges and was in the same rehab program at Moorberg House. That offender was given a conditional sentence order. Wildcat was sent to the penitentiary. Debbie Bjors is a former Crown attorney. She is not connected to this case. They were eligible, both eligible for a CSO, um, and yet only one got the benefit of that and not the other, and I don't know why. Wildcat found success in restorative justice until it was taken away. Help with trade from them, you know. Now five months in prison, there is new hope. Lawyers are working on an appeal. Jill McEshawn, CTV News, Winnipeg. Three First Nations in Alberta have signed an agreement with the provincial and federal governments to move child welfare services back under banned control. Loon River, Peerless Trout and Lubicon Lake First Nations signed the documents yesterday. More and more First Nations across Canada are taking child welfare into their own hands, something that Lubicon Lake Chief Billy Joe Labucan is encouraging to continue. All across uh, Canada, you know, it's it's really time for First Nations to uh, 
take over their governance, you know, and, and get away from the, uh, you know, all of the um, ill effects of the Indian Act. You know, we have to uh, take that piece of uh, policy and put it to rest, you know, and, and give the control back to the First Nations. We can do a better job in governing ourselves and being able to provide health and child welfare services than anyone else can. You know, we we're, we're doing it for thousands of years. In Nova Scotia, the chief of a Mi'kmaq nation says a sewage lagoon has polluted the community's surrounding waters. He is frustrated that the lagoon was built next to a lake in the first place. Angel Moore brings us a preview of this story. I'm here at the Bola Hadek First Nation in Unamagi, Mi'kmaq for Cape Breton. The community has struggled for safe water for decades. A new water treatment facility was installed about four years ago, but the chief says the sewage lagoon is polluting the surrounding waters. The fish are gone and no one will swim in the area. Frustrated with water issues, the Mi'kmaq are fixing their water systems themselves with the Atlantic First Nations Water Authority, a Mi'kmaq-led initiative. This story to come on APTN National News. Welcome back to APTN National News. A report developed by sex workers in Vancouver, BC is bringing awareness to the unique challenges they face. Developed by the Metro Vancouver Consortium, the By Us, For Us research project surveyed more than 200 sex workers in the area. It found that 45% of those surveyed were indigenous and over a quarter of that group identified as two-spirit. The report noted Indigenous sex workers are disproportionately involved in street-level work, making them more prone to violence and harm. While it is legal to sell sex in Canada, buying and advertising the work is not. It calls for decriminalization so that, quote, sex workers could more easily access resources that prevent and respond to harm. And Mabrat Bayani is the executive director of the Wish Drop-In Center Society, one of the organizations involved, and she joins me now. Mabrat, thank you so much for taking some time for us today. Why was it important to have the report prepared with the input of sex workers? Yeah, thanks, Daryl, and thanks so much for your interest in the in the report. Um, the The reason for that is that there's just so much out there that is either deeply stigmatized about sex workers, or that sex workers themselves rarely get to speak to uh, directly and not filtered by you know non sex non sex workers or by advocacy organizations. So this is this is really significant that it was directed by sex workers, and that it is directly the voices of sex workers themselves. So is that what makes this report unique? Then? Than to others that may be out there? It's one of the reasons that makes it really unique. Uh, the other reason is that, you know, for those of us that support sex workers or that work alongside sex workers, there's such little data and information out there, period. Um, and, and so trying to back up all of the anecdotal information and all that we know and that we hear from sex workers directly and to actually have it confirmed um, without a shadow of a doubt is really significant. The other reason that this is this is significant is that it's also the largest of its kind that we've been able to pull off or that our colleagues have been able to pull off. Um, we found all through COVID that as we were trying to raise the flag and raise the alarm about what was happening for sex workers, it was so difficult to consistently maintain that attention because there's not enough data out there. Right. And Mabrat, for you, what were the most surprising findings from this? Um, I would say how high some of the numbers were. So none of the areas were surprising, but how significant they were was certainly surprising. So for example, the number of sex workers that identified as living with disabilities was much higher than any of us had anticipated or fully, fully understood. Um, and same thing in terms of housing precarity. Same thing for really, really basic, and I'm, I'm just sort of cherry picking here because mm -hmm. there's just so much richness in the report, but same thing for really basic access to services, including safe and clean washrooms. Okay. So 
you know, what, what we saw was definitely a clear picture of where the risks are, where the potentials for exploitation are. Um, and the last piece, which again, isn't so much a surprise, but certainly the level of uh, fear and concern around personal safety. Okay. We've always known to be really high, but this study absolutely confirms it. Um, and the number of people naming things like food precarity and hunger as uh, as one of the pressure points was so much higher than we thought. Mm -hmm. Well, how were in Indigenous women affected? Yeah, so you know, in this in this study, forty five percent of the respondents were Indigenous, and I think there's there's a number of layers here. There's a, a number of layers of invisibility that Indigenous sex workers face, and additional scrutiny and additional stigma that Indigenous sex workers face. So there are you know, a number of people who are trading sex in one way or another, and some of them may not out, you know, may not be out as identified sex workers because of the level of stigma. And for indigenous sex workers, I think there's additional levels of stigma, discrimination, racism, predatory behavior uh, that, that aligns with a lot of the calls to action that all of us stand in solidarity with around missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Mm -hmm. And so much of this study also centers around gender and race. So we know what that looks like. We know what it looks like when those uh, identities intersect and when they intersect in the body of somebody who uh, who is trading sex. So, you know, I would say for, for black sex workers, for indigenous sex workers, and for sex workers who um, are gender diverse, and a lot of times that might all be one person, mm -hmm. that definitely has a disproportionately higher amount of um, precarity or potential um, risk of ex exploitation. And last question for you here, Mabrat, uh, what do you hope will come from this? That's a great question. I would hope that there is renewed focus, that there's increased focus, not even renewed, but increased focus on the issues facing a diversity of sex workers, that there is uh, significant attention paid to the resources necessary to support sex workers, that there is a new focus on the calls to action, including at a federal level, decriminalizing the legislation and decriminalizing sex work, and to pay attention to the calls to, the calls to action and recommendations in this report because they speak directly to sex workers' rights, which are human rights, mm -hmm. and they align with so many other calls to action around poverty reduction, health and safety, gender-based violence, the right to work safely, the ability to turn down unsafe work. All of these come together um, in this report and in terms of what sex workers are telling us, and it's high time that we pay attention. Well, Mabrat, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you so much for coming on and, and providing some insight for us. Thanks, Daryl. All right, it's time to pause the news one more time here, but still to come, highlights from today's In Focus. And the winner is APTN Investigates brings home another award. Are they being human trafficked versus are they being sexually assaulted? Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. A beautiful full moon over the Cookham's Outreach in Alberta. Thanks to April Isidore for taking the time to share this with us and all of our viewers. You can email your pictures to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. All right now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. We begin on the east coast, 3 degrees in St. John's and 15 and clear in Halifax. Minus 2 in Kujawak and 6 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Clear in 14 in Quebec City and clear in 25 in Montreal. 28 degrees and clear in Toronto, look at those temperatures. And 17 in Sault Ste. Marie. 15 degrees in Timmins and 12 in Thunder Bay. Minus 10 in Churchill and 5 degrees in Thompson. Barron's River is looking at 9 degrees and Winnipeg is looking at 11. 6 degrees in Regina and 11 in Saskatoon. 7 degrees in Buffalo Narrows and 3 in Uranium City. 
as we continue our trek west of 4 degrees in Fort Chippewa and 10 in Grand Prairie. 12 in Edmonton and 9 in Calgary. 10 degrees in Vancouver and 10 in Bella Coola. 7 degrees in Prince Rupert and 8 in Fort Nelson. Minus 1 in Beaver Creek and snow and minus 10 in Rock River. Minus 6 in Norman Wells and 0 degrees in Yellowknife. Snow and minus 16 in Fort McPherson and minus 16 in Inuvik. Minus 13 in Cambridge Bay and minus 12 in Whale Cove. Minus 11 in Arctic Bay and minus 4 in Calgary. The 2023 Canadian Screen Awards for News and Documentaries were announced last night in Toronto. Among the winners, two members of APTN's Investigates crew. Here's Annette Francis. Kenneth Jackson and Colin Crozer took home an award for Best News or Information Program for In Plain Sight. Are they being human trafficked? Versus are they being sexually assaulted? The Investigates episode reveals the sex trade playing out in the streets of the city of Kenora when the sun goes down. Let's welcome to the stage of the St. Marie. Cree singer-songwriter Buffy St. Marie won for the Best Direction documentary program for her latest documentary, carry it on. It highlights her six decade career as a performer and as an activist. It's my own. She was always way ahead of the game. Annette Francis, ten National News, Ottawa. Congratulations to Kenneth and Cullen on that award. There are many class action lawsuits ongoing in Canada that are impacting Indigenous people from forced sterilization to residential school. Those lawsuits were at the forefront of our In Focus episode this week. Take a look. Without class actions, things don't happen. And we know that because we're representing people from back in the 30s in some cases where nothing has happened and nothing would happen. And but for firms like ours and lawyers, I might say, like me, that hear about these cases and are approached, if we didn't take them on, nothing would change. Now you've covered the story of forced sterilizations among Indigenous women. So first off, what can you tell us about this issue? There was actually a law called the Sterilization Act, which did not apply solely to Indigenous people, but a lot of Indigenous people uh, were sterilized as a result of the acts. In fact, um, more and more as time went on, which, which was interesting. We'll keep um, fighting the good fight and nothing's perfect, but um, let's hope that some of these actions not only um, result in compensation for these past harms, but um, play some role in shifting things moving forward and, and fixing um, broken policies and broken systems. Day scholars were left out of a key part of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. Uh, in particular, they didn't receive the common experience payment. Uh, so this class action, uh, this lawsuit, was an attempt uh, to, un, uh, to, to fix that injustice uh, and to include the excluded. All right, that's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News. If you missed any of our show tonight, our website has got you covered. That's aptnnews.ca. For all of us here, thank you so much for joining us. Miigwech, Kinanaskamitan. Have a great evening.